Good morning, it is Sunday, April 9th, 2023, and I'm Pastor Mark Dilley of West Valley Grace Fellowship. I pray that the message this morning will be used to strengthen you in your faith and encourage you in your walk with our Savior and Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. We've been going through the book of Galatians, and we last week we talked about the fruit of the Spirit, and we began with love and the preeminence that love is to play in our life as believers. And we will direct our attention to the next two characteristics or elements in that cluster of fruit, joy and peace. But before we do that, I think I'd like to direct our attention to the importance of the resurrection of Christ. And so, the word resurrection, as you can see on your handout, means to stand up, literally or figuratively, transitively or intransitively, to stand erect. And some further definitions, a raising up or a rising, in other words, from a seat. It, had, it was often used when someone would get up from sleep to arouse from sleep. Well, what do you do when you wake up? Typically, you get up. And so that means to stand erect. And that is an important thing to understand about the resurrection. I think most people confuse the terms resurrection and ascension. Christ resurrected on the third day from the tomb, but he didn't ascend to heaven for 40 days when he left the apostles and ascended to heaven. So the, the resurrection of Christ occurred when he, having been separated from his terrestrial body through death on the cross, instantaneously arose, and here's something I want to point out. He arose in the tomb when he received his celestial body it's a physical body different than the terrestrial body that he had before now he could walk through material objects like the wall in the upper room and different things like that and so uh, I think most people picture the resurrection as it's often pointed they they show the opening of the tomb and the door rolled away and a big bright shining light and everybody sort of focused on that event as the resurrection. But that's not the resurrection. That's simply the resurrected Christ coming out of the tomb. He was resurrected the instant he was raised from the dead. And after that, he is now living in his glorified uh, celestial body and so the resurrection of Christ occurred instantly I believe in the tomb when Christ received that eternal body and and one of the things that the Apostle Paul, Paul points out for us we're going to have a body fashioned after that body and there are some other things I won't get into today but I think our understanding of our resurrection body is uh, depreciated or misunderstood because of the influence of the teaching of the resurrection of Old Testament saints. And so if that stirs your curiosity, I direct you to 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 5. And, uh, and then if you still have some questions, I'd be happy to talk about it or even teach on it again. I've mentioned it at other times, and not many people hold that position that I'm talking about. <clears throat> Most people, I think, are still somewhat limited because they're looking about what Christ talked about resurrection. He wasn't talking about resurrected saints from the church, the body of Christ. He was talking about resurrected Jewish people and the covenant God had committed to them. Their bodies are going to come out of the grave because they're going to be terrestrial bodies and go into their kingdom. 
And so one will be left and one will be taken. The one left is the one that comes out of that body, uh, comes out of that grave, and the ones taken are not taken in the rapture. They're taken to judgment, just as they were in the days of Noah. And so if you want further explanation of that, someday, someday we'll get to that, hopefully. So the resurrection of the sinless Son of God is indispensable for the efficaciousness of the gospel of salvation. As David mentioned, if he is not risen, we're, we're, our faith is in vain and we're still in our sins. And so the resurrection is an essential element in God's plan and purpose of salvation for the world. In 1 Corinthians 15, and it's a little bit of a long passage, but I think it's important. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning with verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Uh, being a mathematician, I look at things, try to look at things sort of objectively, more so than emotionally. And, uh, and so this makes so much logical sense to me. If it's preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? That's what Paul was preaching. You either believe that or you don't. Verse 13. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. In other words, there's either resurrection or there isn't. And if there is none, then Christ wasn't raised. And he goes on to say, And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. Now he's going back to that argument again. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. There's no middle ground. This is absolute. Either Christ is raised from the dead, and if he's raised from the dead, there is a resurrection. If, he was, if there is no resurrection, then Christ is not raised from the dead, and nobody is. In verse 17, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. So that's how important the resurrection is. There is no salvation apart from the resurrection of Christ. And then he goes on to conclude in verse 18, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. Wouldn't that be a shame if, if all of this was only for this life? I'll tell you, it'd be rather disappointing. A lot of people think this is hell is on earth here. That's how bad they think it is, but that's nothing compared to what hell is going to be like, I can guarantee you. But if our only hope was whatever joy we extracted out of the 70, 80 years we have on this life, if that's all we got, we just will eat, drink, and be merry, I think. Because it isn't worth it to me. But knowing that Christ has been raised from the dead, knowing that when he appears in glory, I'm going to appear with him there. That makes it all worthwhile. This life will soon be passed, but the next life is for eternity. It's either an eternity in Christ with God forever, or an eternity separated from Christ, separated from God in the lake of fire for eternity. And so Paul concludes in verse 20, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. At the present time, the Lord Jesus Christ is the only person that has been resurrected from the dead to eternal life. 
But he's promising here that one day, that he is just the first fruits of all those who have fallen asleep, believing in the gospel of God, whatever that was during their time. It's important to understand in the gospel, the grace of God, there is a heavenly hope. In the gospel of the kingdom, there's an earthly hope. But both of them will be for an eternity in God's presence. The, 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 re, re, the resurrection represents God's stamp of approval, avowing that the Lord Jesus Christ <coughs> had finished the work that the Father had sent him to accomplish. When he said on that cross, and we're going to read it in a minute, it is finished. He had completed the means for the redemption of mankind. But when he said that, it was only known for whatever scripture had been revealed up to that point. And so when he said it is finished, he had completed the work that his father had sent him to do. And that was the redemption of Israel. And so that's what he died for, so Israel could be redeemed spiritually. The blood of his holy, sinless son was shed for all who would believe the gospel of salvation. Now that's a revelation that comes from Paul. That now... Christ came into the world to die for sinners. And that's what we are. And so let's look at a couple passages here first. John 17, 1 through 5. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might have etern might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought, brought, brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world began. Now, all that he's saying here, we can make an application from, but we need to understand that when he's saying this, he's talking to his heavenly Father about his mission and ministry during his earthly life. And that was for the redemption of Israel and that primarily alone. In John 19, 28, and 30, later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. In other words, that's when Jesus died. And again, death is not the cessation of existence. Death is a separation. In physical death, it's the separation of the soul and the spirit from the body. And that's what happened on that cross. After hanging there for three hours in darkness, he died. Now we know today, when Peter and the apostles and the early disciples in the book of Acts talked about the cross, there was no glory in that cross. That cross was a crime. You murdered the Messiah. You killed the Son of God. You crucified the Holy One. It was not a good thing. It was not a good Friday. That came later with the revelation of the gospel of the grace of God and the gospel that was declared by the Apostle Paul. But at this time, it was not a good thing, although it was always a good thing. It was just not proclaimed at that point as the good thing. In the revelation of the gospel of the grace of God, the Apostle 
expounds further on the resurrection, and this is now the Apostle Paul. Much, we have a much greater understanding of all that transpired through the death and resurrection of Christ from the writings of the Apostle Paul. And so in Romans 1, 1 through 4, Paul says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Paul's talking about the Old Testament. And the gospel that was promised there was God was going to provide an anointed one, a redeemer, who would die for their sins. And that hasn't changed one iota. And so he goes on to say, promised before and through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David. That's critical in their gospel. And that makes him the king of kings. That he's going to reign over Israel for all eternity. And then verse 4, And who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Today, there are many, many people that talk about God and God's love for us, about how wonderful God is, their relationship with God, but they don't really talk much about Jesus Christ our Lord. They might talk about a relationship with him or something, but the depth that Paul makes known for us, our relationship with God through our association or our identification with Christ is what separates the believers from the professors today. And that's why I try to avoid the term Christian as much as possible. There's nothing wrong with the word Christian. We are Christians. But what isn't understood, so was Peter a Christian. So was John the Baptist a Christian. Anybody that follows Christ is a Christian. But they hold a different position in God's plan than we do as members of the body of Christ. And that's the kind of differentiation we need to make clear to people when we talk about the importance of the resurrection for us. It has a different hope laid up for us than it does for Peter and the rest of them. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, the Apostle Paul says, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Paul talks about the gospel that he preached to them, the word gospel means good news. And all this is good news. In Ephesians 2, 4 through 7, Paul writes this, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ. Now there's that word resurrection, the same base word as resurrection. But this isn't talking about physically right now. But we have already been resurrected spiritually. This is a, what we would call a past tense verb in English. That already in God's sight, we have been raised up with Christ and seated us in seated us in with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. When I first used to read this last verse 7, I used to think he's going to illumine our eyes to all the grace of God that we had while we were here on earth. But now I believe he's going to continue to 
for all eternity to reveal to us his amazing grace. Every, their time will be no more, so there won't be yesterdays and stuff like that as time measurement. But throughout eternity, we're going to see more and more of the grace of God. That's my position on it, and it makes me feel very good. And then in Philippians, I want you to know, I want to know, Paul says this, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so, somehow, to attain to the, and I've inserted the word there that doesn't show up in the English, attain to the out-resurrection from the dead. When, when Paul talks about uh, the resurrection of Christ, the, the power of his resurrection, he's talking about what we're celebrating today in our resurrection with him. Paul knew that one day he's going to be resurrected. It's not something he was going to attain to. It was something that God had already promised him that was in his future. What he's praying here, I believe, is he wants to know the power of the resurrection in his present life right now. The power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in every believer. And that power is the power that we're going to talk about some more as we get back to the fruit of the Spirit. That's the power of Christ in us, or the power of God in us to enjoy and to manifest the power of Christ living in us. And so when he talks about that he might attain to the out-resurrection, I don't think he's talking about that resurrection. He's talking about right now in this life that we might have the power to live as if we're already actually experiencing our resurrection in Christ. Because we haven't experienced the physical resurrection yet. We're still living in this ugly, sinful flesh. We're still shackled with a sinful nature that is anti-God. And so we have this struggle between the flesh and the spirit going on continually. And that's, I believe, what Paul is praying here. That not just knowing that one day I'm going to be resurrected physically, I want to live like I have already experienced that. And I can only do that through the power of God. And so he goes on to say, that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm on a whole different verse. Romans 6, 4, and 5. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Now again, uh, we talk about this a lot. I hope when we hear, see that word baptism there, we didn't think about water baptism. We thought about the fact that every saint, every person who has believed that Jesus Christ died for their sins is immediately baptized when they believe that into Christ. And you're baptized into all that Christ experienced. And so when he died, we died with Christ. When he was buried, we were buried with Christ. Now that wasn't physically, that's in the spiritual realm. But that's what it is all about at the present time, is our spiritual walk with Christ. And then he was raised to walk in new, or he, we're going to be. It, let's go on. He says... Uh, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. That's that power that he wants to be in him so he can live that life right now. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. That's still a future thing physically. We will be one day physically resurrected whether it be through the rapture or through uh, the power of receiving our new bodies from heaven. It is through knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection that we are enabled to now live a new life.
that should be the emphasis of Easter for us. We understand, we rejoice in the resurrection of Christ, but for us, it's to live a new life right now. That's what should be our heart's desire. And then we can attain to the out-resurrection by walking in the Spirit. We can live lives worthy of our calling and manifest the fruit of the Spirit, which is Christ living in us. And it is accomplished totally by the power that raised Christ from the dead. It's like that power living in us, the power of God. And so this new life began for us when we believed the gospel of salvation and trusted in Christ who died for our sins. Now with Christ living in us, we are exalt, or exhorted to yield our bodies to him. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore I urge you, brethren, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And that first part of verse 2, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. The pattern of this world, one of the things in that pattern is desensitization to sin. Remember back in when we were youngsters, and this includes most of us, if you got pregnant out of marriage, it was a no-no, a taboo. Yeah, I can remember in Wisconsin, if you were under the age of 18, you couldn't get married. And so they were in sort of a tight fix. So they would go to Iowa where you only had to be 16 to get married. And they'd get married in Iowa, and then they'd come back and be legally married. It wasn't nearly as complicated in those days as it is today. But now, I was just thinking, you know, the big movement when the hippies and all of that started was the love generation and all of that, and make love, not war. That, it Doesn't that sound nice? But they're really talking about Let's fornicate. That's what they were talking about. Let's love one another and fornicate. That's sin. But if we listen to it long enough, we become comfortable with it. So fornication becomes acceptable. Adultery, people used to look down on somebody if they committed adultery. Today, it's expected almost. We even have a phrase for it. Right? You get a certain amnesty if you get to the point where you're having this midlife crisis, that that's almost acceptable. You, you've lived your life with your first wife and everything, and now you want to have another opportunity to make it better or something. We, Satan has been a, a mastermind at desensitizing us to calling a sin a sin. And today, today, a lot of those things that we don't dare call sin anymore, if we do lay it out like the Bible does, it's a hate crime. Remember the Bible says calling good bad and bad good? It's just, it, it's ridiculous today. How thankful I am for the truth of God's word, his amazing grace that would save a wretch like me. So Paul exhorts us to present ourselves to God. Here I am, Lord, use me. And then he goes on to say, or I, I'm going to say, we are also commanded by Paul. Now, people say we're not under the law. No, we're not. There is no, if you don't do this, I'm going to do this to you. That's basically what the law is. If you do this, I will do this. We're not under that law, but that doesn't mean we're free from commandments. We're not totally free from being told, here is what you are to do. Now, we're free to do whatever we want because we're not under the law. There is no uh, working out of our choices other than don't be deceived. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. But as far as spiritually is concerned, if we don't do what Paul says here, 
we will just suffer loss just because we didn't do it. And so here he says in Romans 6, 3, do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. That's the only way that we will live righteously in this world is through the power that raised Christ from the dead. And so this understanding the resurrection and the gospel of salvation is the doorway now to be experientially sanctified and to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. And having presented love as the greatest and overriding characteristic of this fruit, Lord willing, next week we'll continue to examine how love influences the other components. And so how blessed we should be not to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, to not be knocked down and out when things appear beyond our hope and understanding because nothing is outside the realm of God's purpose and plan for our life. And we can rejoice, as we're going to get into next week, in every circumstance, because this is God's will for us. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, what a blessing it is, what a privilege it is, to know that when you died, it wasn't the end. When you died, it was the end of the old covenant. But it was the beginning of a revelation called the new covenant that God made with Israel and Judah. And even now, with the revelation of the gospel of your grace, your resurrection has given us the assurance and the confidence of the truth of your word. And so I pray no one here has any doubt whatsoever that you died, you were buried, and you rose again on the third day. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the great salvation that we now have in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.